Good afternoon. I'm Martha Minow, and as Dean of the Harvard Law School, it gives me deepest pleasure and honor to welcome you to the Scalia Lecture. We will hear shortly from Professor John Manning on the subject without the pretense of legislative intent. But first, let me give you some background about this lecture. And, you know, I'm a dean, so it means I'm going to say some other things, too. The Justice Antonin Scalia Lecture is a series established at Harvard Law School in 2013 by an anonymous donor to promote and advance understanding of the founding principles and core doctrines of the United States Constitution. Speakers are drawn from the fields of political science, history, philosophy, law, government, religion, and related disciplines. The person chosen to be the Scalia lecturer is a scholar or figure of high distinction who, through his or her work, research, writings, and teaching, elucidates the principles of the American founding. It is expected that the Scalia lecture will be held annually. This is the first one to be delivered since Justice Scalia's passing. It is meaningful for us to hold this event today and to mark the enduring legacy of this extraordinary justice. In her tribute to him in the Harvard Law Review, Justice Elena Kagan said, and I quote, a hundred years from now, no one will know what many of us on the court today either wrote or accomplished. That is not true of Justice Scalia. He will go down in history as one of the most significant justices and also one of the greatest. His articulation of textualist and originalist principles communicated in that distinctive, splendid prose transformed our legal culture. It changed the way almost all judges and so almost all lawyers think and talk about the law, even if they part ways at one or another point from his interpretive theories. I personally learned so much from him and so enjoyed our conversations and his demonstration of a life well lived, a life with friendships not despite but because of differences, a life devoted to the study and development of law, and to the support of his friends and remarkable family. We are so honored to have members of his family here today, Mrs. Scalia, and in addition, we have Trish and Jean, um, and we um, have Katie and Will, and I am so very touched by your presence. We have other special guests, um, but I'm going to go ahead now and just tell you one more thing, which is, is with great uh, honor and delight that we announce today that the Scalia family is donating the papers of Justice Scalia to the Harvard Law School Library. This extraordinary gift will be a resource for lawyers and scholars and teachers for generations to come. And I'm going to invite Maureen Scalia to come up and say a few words, if you would. Thank you. Dean Minow and everyone. I, well, first, I, I want to say that we are the ones who feel honored that, that Harvard is accepting Nino's work, uh, gives really honor to him and to our family. Uh, he, he learned to love the law here as a student. He learned how law should be taught, and he loved to teach law. So this has a great deal of meaning to us. Uh, but there is another reason why I really appreciate this and it has great significance because I think about 58 years ago at Harvard Law School at a law review reception, I got to know a very interesting third year law student. <laughs> and it, that was the beginning of our years of adventure together. So thank you. Thank you.
look forward to hearing more about that particular encounter. So <laughs> wonderful. I do want to give my deep thanks to people who helped to uh, work on this wonderful gift, and that includes Jocelyn Kennedy, Executive Director of our library, Karen Beck, who manages historical manuscript, Ed Malloy, who curates modern manuscripts, Jessica Farrell, who curates digital collections, and Peter Cerisi from the uh, Office of General Counsel. Um, and please uh, join me in thanking them all for helping to make this wonderful gift work. So with uh, great personal joy, I get to introduce my friend and colleague, John F. Manning. He is the Bruce Bromley Professor of Law here. He joined the faculty in 2004. He's been Deputy Dean since 2013. That means that he uh, is my uh, deepest uh, confident and greatest uh, advisor. Before coming to Harvard Law School, he was uh, the Michael Sovereign Professor at Columbia Law School, uh, and he started teaching in 1994. How many of you have had Professor Manning in a class? Excellent. Then you know he teaches magnificently administrative law, federal courts, legislation, regulation, separation of powers, statutory interpretation, and his writing focuses on those fields. He's a co-editor of the magisterial Hart and Wexler Federal Courts and Federal Systems book, and also of the pioneering text, legislation, and regulation. Prior to becoming a law professor, his public service included serving as an assistant to the Solicitor General of the United States Department of Justice, serving as an attorney advisor in the Office of Legal Counsel in the Department of Justice. And he uh, also was a law clerk for Judge Robert Bork, and most specially, he was a law clerk for Justice Scalia. He also had a time in private practice. He graduated from Harvard College, Harvard Law School. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. But here's what's most important. He is wise, he has great integrity, he is brilliant, and he so admired his boss, Justice Scalia, and shares his devotion to craft, to the law, to kindness, and to friendship. John Manning. Thank you, Dean Minow, for that uh, extravagant introduction. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm very happy that the Scalia family is here, and I want to acknowledge, acknowledge out-of-town guests, colleagues, students. Um, I'm thrilled to deliver this year's Scalia lecture. As the dean mentioned, I was a law clerk to Justice Scalia, and that clerkship was an unforgettable experience. Perhaps because he had been a law professor and was used to arguing with young people, or perhaps because what he cared most about was getting things right, Justice Scalia ran his chambers with an unusual openness and intellectual generosity. He encouraged us to mix it up, to argue with him, and to tell him exactly what we thought, even and especially if we thought he was making a mistake. It was not just fun, it was inspiring. I will always be grateful to Justice Scalia for his kindness and his generosity. I am also grateful for his unerring friendship to this law school, which he loved and visited many times in the past dozen years. And I want to join Dean Minow in thanking the Scalia family for the incredible honor of entrusting Harvard Law School with the Justice's historic papers. Once the archive is opened, I know that generations of scholars will come to Harvard to study the records of Justice Scalia's historic tenure on the Supreme Court. So today, for the Scalia Lecture, I'm going to talk briefly about a subject that was near and dear to Justice Scalia's heart, the law of statutory interpretation. It was an area in which Justice Scalia perhaps had his greatest impact on the law. I graduated from this law school in 1985, uh, and it is hard today when I talk to my legislation and regulation students for them to fathom just how different things were back then. No one <laughs> talked about dictionaries. In fact, if you cited a dictionary, your classmates would 
stare at you with a mixture of disbelief and perhaps a bit of concern. <laughs> and after Carl Llewellyn's devastating critique of the canons of construction, it would have been eccentric at the very best even to refer to one of those canons, especially if it was worded in Latin. In those days, statutory interpretation was all about finding legislative intent, or as Judge Posner put it, trying to, quote, think one's way into the minds of the enacting legislators. On that account, the judge's job was to try to imagine as best as he or she could how Congress would have wanted to resolve the precise question and issue at the case, in the case at hand. Now, I think some of you know that I don't buy this approach myself, but I have to concede that there's a certain intuition behind it. If somebody sends me a note with a word or phrase that I don't perfectly understand, I want to know what they meant or intended by it. And sometimes I might even think that the note writer meant or intended something other than what they said. So if one day my kid sends me a text saying, please pick me up from school at 3 a.m., I'm going to be pretty darn sure that she intends me to be there at 3 in the afternoon and not in the middle of the night. And my guess about her true intention is exactly what's going to guide me in deciphering the meaning of that note. And that is what intentionalism is all about. Now, in the years before Justice Scalia joined the court, intentionalism had grown into an art form. The court had come to trust legislative history, especially the statements made by a bill's drafters. If we can decipher a note by asking what the note writer meant, then why not simply ask what the principal authors of legislation meant when they drafted the legislation being interpreted? And so the court treated sponsor statements and committee reports as the gold standard of legislative intent. And just as you might use a little common sense to decipher a note from a friend or from a kid, the court thought it should use common sense in trying to decipher the meaning of statutes. OK, so think about a textbook example from that era, which is familiar to some of the legislation and regulation students in this room. It is Train versus Colorado Public Interest Research Group. Now, here's what the case was about. Congress gave the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, explicit authority to regulate the discharge of, quote, radioactive materials into the nation's waterways. Now, you might think that this language would give the agency authority to regulate, say, plutonium, or maybe uranium enriched in the isotope 233 or 235. You might think that but you would be quite wrong. And why is that? Now, I'm going to simplify a bit, but the basic reason was that the Senate sponsor got on the floor and said that the bill was not intended to give the EPA overlapping jurisdiction with the Atomic Energy Commission, which already regulated the discharge of those particular source materials. And as a matter of regulatory policy, the court said, that intention made total sense. So the court found it, quote, abundantly clear after a, view, a review of the legislative materials that reliance on the, quote, plain meaning, they put plain meaning in scare quotes, the plain meaning of the words radioactive materials contributes little to our understanding of what Congress intended the act to encompass. That was eight to nothing. Whoa. <laughs> now. That approach, shall we say, offended Justice Scalia's sensibilities. Um, the legislative history part offended his sense of formalism. If a sponsor statement or a committee report can settle a statute's meaning, then that material becomes effectively like part of the statutory st text. Congress, however, has passed the text and nothing but the text. And so the legislative history should not have the same force and effect. It did not go through bicameralism and presentment as Article I requires. More generally, and more importantly, the very idea of legislative intent offended Justice Scalia's admittedly less well-known sense of legal realism. 
This was partly because he didn't buy the idea that most legislators necessarily agreed with what a sponsor or a committee had to say about the meaning of a bill being interpreted. But his concern went far deeper than that. He thought that on any question hard enough to make it into a court, and especially on any question hard enough to make it into his court, Congress simply had no actual intent. It didn't really decide the question at issue. And here's what he had to say. And this is a quote. <laughs> With respect to 99.9% .9 of the issues of construction reaching the courts, there is no legislative intent. Most of the issues involve points of relative, de relative detail. The majority of both houses of Congress, never mind the President, if he signed rather than vetoed the bill, entertained any view with regard to such, the, I'm sorry, that a majority of both houses of Congress, never mind the President, if he signed rather than vetoed the bill, entertained any view with regard to such issues, you've got to get the intonation right, is utterly beyond belief. For a virtual certainty, the majority of members were blissfully unaware, uh, much less had any preference about how it should be resolved. In his view, then, an inquiry into unenacted legislative intent was, quote, an invitation to judicial lawmaking. It was, to him, a usurpation of democratic prerogatives. Okay, what I've said so far is hardly news. This idea, this intense skepticism, is heavily associated with Justice Scalia and with his close intellectual ally, Judge Frank Easterbrook. It's thought to be a cornerstone of modern textualism, and most of the many critiques of intense skepticism that you see in the law journals today frame their arguments specifically as responses to textualism. This emphasis, however, overlooks the fact that Justice Scalia's intense skepticism itself reflected a very deeply rooted intellectual tradition, and in particular, a very deeply rooted intellectual tradition at his alma mater, Harvard Law School. In connection with our upcoming bicentennial celebration, the Harvard Law Review asked me to research the history of statutory interpretation at this school. And here's what I learned. Justice Scalia came by his intense skepticism honestly. It reflects a deeply rooted anti-legislative intent impulse that cuts across generations of Harvard scholars and across, across the highly diverse array of approaches of Harvard's legal realists, progressives, new dealers, legal process purposivists, and ultimately also its textualists. Now there are certainly famous counterexamples, some of whom are on the federal bench, but I will say that Harvard's intense skepticism has a pretty impressive lineup. It's impressive in part because of the importance of the thinkers and in part because of how broadly different approaches build upon its premises. I can't go through every last one of them, and I won't even try, but I'll mention some of the biggies, including some that will be, I think, surprising. All right, so let's start with Roscoe Pound, the former dean of this law school and one of the leaders of the progressive movement. Pound's claim to fame was sociological jurisprudence, the idea that judges should interpret, their, uh, interpret statutes in light of social realities and the imperatives of justice, and that they shouldn't pay attention to the formalities of the statutory text. He also thought that judges should not pay attention to the formalities of the common law, or should not heed too closely the formalities of the common law. Now this seems to be a far cry from Justice Scalia, but here's what Dean Pound had to say about legislative intent. He wrote that in hard cases, the legislature, quote, has no actual intent. And he went farther still, arguing that, quote, the difficulties of so-called interpretation arise only when the legislature has had no meaning at all. Clearly, Pound, like Scalia, was an intent skeptic. Or consider New Dealer James Landis, another Harvard dean who wrote in this tradition. Landis thought that American judges inherited broad, inherent lawmaking powers from their English forebears. He wanted courts to revive the so-called equity of the statute, an ancient English doctrine that gave judges intrinsic powers to make statutes more coherent and more just. 
They did so, moreover, without regard to legislative intent. Landis, like Pound, was about as far from a textualist as you could possibly be. But he believed that most of the time, quote, the meaning of the legislature is not discoverable, and that quotes in courts invoke legislative intent to elide, quote, their role as actual lawgivers. This practice, he thought, had the baneful effect of enabling courts, quote, to talk in terms of the intent of the legislature as if the legislature had attributed a particular meaning to certain words when it is apparent that the intent is that of the judge. And then there are professors Henry Hart and Albert Sachs, the founders of the Legal Process School. In some ways, what I discovered about Hart and Sachs was the most surprising of all. They were the Academy's purposivists in chief, not so easy to say, purposivists in chief. They urged judges to read words purposively and systematically to assume that legislation was adopted by, quote, reasonable persons pursuing reasonable purposes reasonably. And to Hart and Sachs, that imperative authorized judges to cut back on the generality of language and even at times to extend the policy of legislation to unforeseen cases. The legal process school was the very approach that modern textualism sought to displace. It turns out, however, that the legal process school also rejected the idea that judges could find legislative intent. To be sure, Hart and Sachs thought that judges could and should reason from the broad policy impulses that lay behind legislation. But they decidedly rejected the idea that judges could determine how Congress decided to resolve the precise question at issue. Hart and Sachs thought that in most cases, quote, the overwhelming probability was that the legislature gave no particular thought to the matter at issue and had no intent concerning it. They also wondered aloud, quote, on what basis does a court decide what the legislature would have done had it foreseen the problem? Does the court consider the political structure of the legislature? Does the court weigh the strength of the various pressure groups operating at the time? How else can the court form a judgment as to what the legislature would have done? So when all is said and done, it seems that Hart and Sachs, too, were intense skeptics. So what do we make of all this intent skepticism? At one level, if you believe in the idea of legislative supremacy, as most of us do, it's profoundly unsettling. Legal philosopher Joseph Raz tells us that if the meaning of a statute is not the meaning that Congress intended, then, and I'm quoting, why does it matter who the members of the legislature are, whether they are democratically elected or not, or whether they are, adult, they are adults or children, sane or insane? And there's something to that. <laughs> At the same time, however, there is also something intuitively grabbing about the idea shared by Pound, Landis, Hart, Sachs, and Scalia, namely that Congress has not actually decided most of the hard questions that make their way to court. In fact, another Harvard alumnus, the great legal philosopher Ronald Dworkin, showed that legislative intent simply does not exist as a fact of the matter, as something sitting out there in the world waiting to be discovered. If I may paraphrase his intricate analysis, Dworkin asked, if one is trying to reconstruct the intent of 536 lawmakers spread across the House, the Senate, and the President, whose intentions count? Is it every member of Congress who voted aye? Is it all members of Congress do you give extra weight to the statute's mo most vocal proponents? What do you do with the fact that agencies may have participated in the drafting process and helped to frame the legislation? And at what level of generality do you frame the counterfactual question of what Congress would have done had it decided the precise question at issue? 
When you come away from that, you realize that the question of how to read a statute is not a factual, but rather a normative question, something re that requires a theory of legislation as well as a theory of adjudication. And that is the point of the Harvard tradition of intense skepticism. Without the pretense of legislative intent, Harvard scholars and judges have argued about what is really at stake in matters of statutory interpretation, namely power and its allocation between Congress and the courts in our system of government. It's what Hart and Sachs called institutional settlement. It's what John Marshall would have thought of as structural con constitutional inference, the technique that he used to decide landmark opinions like McCulloch versus Maryland and Marbury versus Madison. It's what the intense skeptics at the Harvard Law School have fought about thoughtfully and candidly for more than a century. Pound and Landis argued that since statutory meaning quickly runs out, judges should have room to exercise their common law powers to make legislation more coherent and just without regard to legislative intent. Hart and Sachs contended that in our system of government, Congress is not a nitpicker, but rather a problem solver in gross. And since it enacts legislation to effectuate public policy, judges show truer fidelity to Congress when they help Congress to solve those big problems, even if that sometimes means massaging the statutory details. And finally, Justice Scalia thought that even if Congress didn't pick every single word with care, courts should act as if they did. It, they should act as if Congress meant to enact the words it put into the statute, that it acted deliberately. He argued that judges should hug the enacted text and read the words as written. And why is that? In Justice Scalia's constitutional vision, Congress is a compromiser. It has to be able to draw lines of inclusion and exclusion to tell us where its policies start and equally important, where they end. If radioactive materials always means radioactive materials, then words become a reliable metric, a valuable currency for Congress to use to tell us how far its policy goes whether or not it has used those words deliberately to express a particular intention in a particular case. Now you may be thinking to yourself, these are three very different visions of the proper role of Congress and of the courts in matters of interpretation. And on that you would be right. To me, all of them have a ring of plausibility. I have my favorite. <laughs> Um, but I will say that all of them do a surprisingly good job of tying statutory interpretation to a meaningful theory of legislative supremacy. Of course, this presents its own challenges. If all of these theories have a ring of plausibility, how do we decide among them? There's plenty of room for reasonable people to disagree about what, if anything, the Constitution tells us about the judicial power to say what the law is in matters of statutory interpretation. That difficulty, however, is not unique to the constitutional law of statutory interpretation. As is the case with standing, with the removal power, with the legislative veto, and with countless other issues of structural constitutional law, the fact that there is no knockout answer does not relieve us of the need to ask the right questions. It seems to me that by rejecting the pretense of legislative intent, Pound and Landis and Hart and Sachs and Justice Scalia will all, were all arguing about the right things. I will now be very happy to take questions. <laughs>
for our Scalia lecturer. This is for you. Oh my gosh, thank you. <laughs> I, was looking, I was looking for people to call him. And I hope people will soon do this. And then I have a present for the Scalia family. This is a picture of Justice Scalia here at Harvard Law School doing what he did so magnificently, teaching and challenging uh, people to engage. So we will send it to you. You don't have to hear it. <laughs> uh, and I also uh, just want to say that we're glad that our colleague Jonathan Zittrain is here, even though he has a brand new baby, because with his help, we will figure out how to make the Scalia papers accessible to people in the modern age. Thank you. Thank you. you want me to? Hey, if you want it. Yeah, sure, sure. There have got to be questions. Ideally from a student. Oh, well, we'll take one from Professor Jay-Z. <laughs> we are all students, and thank you so much for teaching us today in the grand traditions in which you, uh, which you described. I'm wondering, can Congress make a choice among the three or pick a fourth mode of interpretation? Could Congress pass a law about interpretation and say, you know what, legislative intent matters to us, Please, judges, help us out. If we miss a word there, we use the wrong one, treat us as we would uh, Professor Manning's child uh, about school. <laughs> if they did that, would it be okay or would that be a constitutional problem? Yeah, so it's, it's, a, very, it's a very interesting question. I, I think the answer may be that because the sort of role of the courts and the role of Congress and the nature of how Congress should be conceived as a lawmaker, really there's lots and lots of room for disagreement about this, right? As I said, I have my view, I'm a textualist, but there, there are reasonable people who think something else. Um, and I think in situations like that, you know, my view of Congress is that Congress has broad power uh, to prescribe the means of implementing federal power. That is to say, they have the power to make laws that are necessary and proper for carrying into execution their own powers, and really all the powers of the federal government. And to me, that's a strong signal that Congress should be able to prescribe some rules. And if the rules are within a range, and I think there's a pretty broad range, I think Congress should be able to prescribe rules of construction. Now, for whatever reason, they don't. It's bizarre. They, they, apply, they prescribe some rules of construction, but they're not really very important ones. That is to say, they don't leap into the big debates. So they tell us what a vehicle means. They tell us what a person is. They tell us what happens if you repeal a statute that repealed another statute. So the statute that was repealed by the statute that you repealed doesn't come back into effect if you repeal the statute that repealed that statute. <laughs> That's the level at which Congress prescribes rules of interpretation. So for whatever reason, they haven't waded, waded into the hard stuff. And you know, my own view is, I think they kind of want to be a little bit opaque about this, and they want to push it off and take their chances with, with the. Their <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Is there a mic coming this way? Can you just introduce yes, yourself? Thank you. Hi, I'm Desmond. I'm an LLM. Uh, thank you very much for your time here. I was curious with uh, Scalia talking about hugging the law, however it comes to him, or however that, it comes to the Those are my judges. words, but yes. Oh, well, I, <laughs> you, I think it's a great that. <laughs> visualization of, of uh, how the text should be taken on. And I think, as you mentioned, even if Congress is kind of very uh, flippant about how they're passing a particular law, when it gets to uh, SCOTUS, it has to be treated as if they were very careful about every single detail. Is there, is there something here in Justice Scalia not only saying, you know, you should be uh, treating everything with this detail, but him saying, listen, when it comes here, I'm going, to, I'm going to assume it was that way, and therefore I'm setting a standard for you. So consequently, you have to I'm setting the standard for you, kind of, uh, I have yeah, understood that, you know, he transformed how people would argue in court. He, he liked to set standards. Was he ever very explicit in that being his intention, trying to get everyone to kind of hold themselves to a higher standard? So let me, let me distinguish two, two different things. So one is the idea that the court has an obligation to set a standard for Congress, right, to hold Congress's, to, 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 a, to a kind of a standard of clarity, and precision, 
I, I don't think that that's the appropriate role for a court, and I don't think that he believed that that was his role. I, th I would put it a slightly different way, which is that if you use language consistently, if you take it seriously, if you have a consistent set of norms of interpretation, then what you're doing is you're enabling Congress to use those tools in order to express itself clearly. And he did say that in a couple of places. He said it in a, um, in a, a piece that's published in the George Washington Law Review. It, it was a dialogue between him and me, actually, in which he said, you know, I think we need to act as if Congress is clear, even if it's not clear, not because he's trying to compel them to do something, but trying to enable them to do something, trying to enable them to use words reliably. So he has a famous, and, and he also said it in a case called Finley versus United States, in which he said that the most important thing is for us to establish a clear background rule against which Congress can legislate. And that's partly why he liked, uh, um, you know, clear rules like Chevron. Uh, it's partly why he looked at dictionaries. He wanted to create common points of reference that legislators could use to establish meaning in a, in a reliable way. So one of his famous cases, and, and those of you who have taken uh, uh, some sections of legislative, uh, legislation regulation may have read this case, um, uh, West Virginia University Hospitals against Casey. Um, in that case, the question was, does a grant of authority to award attorney's fees include the grant of authority to award expert fees, right? Fees for an accountant who's advising the attorneys on how to prepare the litigation. And look, attorney's fees standing alone could mean lots of things. It could mean the hourly fees of a lawyer, or it could mean the fees, the reasonable fees for representation, including paralegal fees, Westlaw fees, messenger fees, all sorts of things, right? Transportation. And what he said in that case is attorney's fees can't mean expert fees, can't include expert fees, because there are lots of other statutes that shift attorney's fees and expert fees explicitly. And you know what, what he said about that is, look, if we treat these two different phrases to mean the same thing, then Congress can't use differential wording to express different policies. And I think that was the philosophy, and that's the sort of the version of legislative supremacy. His was not, I don't think, a backward-looking theory of legislative supremacy. Sometimes he wrote as if it was. Sometimes he would actually use the word in intent, not often, but every now and then, he would use the word intent, that, that the text best captures legislative intent or legislative purpose. But if you look at the corpus of his work, and if you look at the things that he said explicitly about why he followed the text, I think it was forward-looking, it was facilitative. It enabled Congress to use its words to delimit the scope of its policies. Other questions? Uh-oh, I've, I've provoked Professor Fallon. <laughs> no, John, this is a magnificent talk on a magnificent occasion, uh, and thank you so much. It's a pleasure and an honor uh, to be here. Um, I have a question about the limits of intent uh, skepticism uh, in the following sense. Justice Scalia often seemed to acknowledge uh, that any time you look at written words, including the written words of a statute, you have to assume that they were words produced by some set of people or some entity uh, with some intended meaning. And so he would say, uh, we have to assume that there is an objective intent, which uh, he differentiated from the subjective yes. uh, intent. And so the objective uh, intent uh, could be the intentions of reasonable people yep. using the words under particular circumstances, or it could be uh, the what ordinary people using those words would have intended in a particular context or something of the kind. But he seemed to acknowledge that anybody has to impute uh, intent to the legislature in yes. order to make sense of a statute. And so I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. And in particular, uh, once you begin the process of thinking that you need to impute some sort of intent, uh, whether the disagreement between the textualists with which you and Justice Scalia uh, ally yourself and the purposivists uh, is really one 
one sharply of kind or whether it's just really more nearly one of degree uh, as we have to assume that this is the product of somebody, even if not the actual people, something like reasonable people. Yeah, so I, I think that there's um, less difference than I once imagined. Um, and I think you've put your finger on something very important, which is, you know, people talk about intent all the time. And I, I, I think that the court generally talks about it loosely and in a way that invites the understanding that they're identifying a decision that Congress made. I think the way Justice Scalia wrote, and this is partly, uh, uh, this is part of what my response was to the last question. I think that the way he wrote, he said, he was going to impute an intention to Congress that was based upon the way reasonable people use language. Now, I know you don't think that he got that right uh, a lot of the time, and, and so that's a, that's a question of how you go about the task. But I think the objective was to say what we're going to do is we're going to assume that Congress used language the same way any reasonable, ordinary person would use it. And that's what Holmes said. It's, I think it's for the same reason that Holmes said that's what you do with contracts, right? Holmes said in um, uh, his famous Harvard article from more than 100 years ago that when you have contracting parties, they may have different subjective understandings uh, of what the contract is. And you have two choices. You can say there's no contract, or you can assume that they meant what a reasonable person means. Now, I do think that's a little bit different from what purpose, purposivists do. What purposivists do is they also impute something to Congress. Here's what they impute to Congress. They impute a reasonable policymaker. S Justice Scalia imputed a reasonable user of language. The reasonable policymaker is slightly different. It's somebody who looks at the text, looks at the circumstances of the legislation, looks at maybe a little bit of legislative history, right, and says, what would a reasonable legislator do about this problem? And that's an imputation also, right? They're both imputed. They both recognize, though, that it's artificial, that they're not doing something that Congress actually decided. And that's why I, I found this project so exciting, because you go back and you look at the way this argument has been fought about at Harvard over the years, and what you see is a really honest debate about these questions. We're not actually trying to decide, figure out what Congress decided here. What we're trying to do instead is come up with a theory of government. And the Hart and Sachs theory is we should treat Congress like a problem solver. And we, if we treat Congress like a problem solver, then our job is to figure out what a re, how a reasonable person would solve the problem that is presented by this case. And Justice Scalia said, OK, we want to treat Congress like a reasonable user of language so that Congress can be awkward and weird and draw strange compromises. And if we think that Congress is reasonable, if that's our imputation, if we think Congress is reasonable, then Congress cannot act unreasonably. And we know they love to do that, right? And so my job, he said, was to draw the lines that match up with the language of the statute. And you're right, they're both imputed. Neither of them better captures what Congress decided, because Hart and Sachs, like Justice Scalia, they were, they were intense skeptics. Does that answer your question? OK. Other questions? I think we have time for a couple more. Oh, Professor Goldsmith has a question. Thank you, John, for that great lecture. My question is, even though he took it in a very different direction, is there any, do you know whether, or is it discoverable, whether Justice Scalia, in fact, absorbed his intense skepticism here? And, and I mean, did he take Hart and Sachs? Did he, is there any evidence that he formed these views here that just took it in a different direction, or is it unknowable? So, so in, in this essay that I'm writing for the bicentennial issue, I have what I call the Vermule disclaimer. Uh, I'm, uh, he, he has the same in his essay for the bicentennial issue. I'm, I'm not trying to do a legal history here, and so I haven't done anything to trace the, in the archives, and we do have archives on, on this, and, and, and um, what, who took what when, but here's, here's some stuff that's available uh, that uh, um, traces a little bit of a chain from among all of these thinkers. So maybe the most 
skeptical of the intent skeptics was John Chipman Gray, who was a legal realist who taught here in the early part of the 20th century. Um, so he was Roscoe Pound's professor. He was also, Felix Frankfurter was his, was uh, John Chipman Gray's research assistant. Uh, then um, Henry Hart and James Landis were students of Frankfurter. Al Sachs was a student of Henry Hart's. Antonin Scalia took the legal process course. I'm not sure with it, whether it was from Hart or Sachs, but it was from one of the two. And so you can trace the chain from John Chipman Gray all the way up to Justice Scalia. But more than that, part of the reason that I read uh, so many quotes today um, was that what struck me as I read these materials was how much similarity there was in the overall approach of these Harvard lawyers, right? That there was so much similarity in the structure of the analysis of the intent skepticism, and then also in the analysis that built on it, right? So you knock down the idea of legislative intent, and then you talk about what you're supposed to impute. And you think about what's your theory of how Congress acts and how Congress should behave, and what's your theory of how the judiciary behaves. And you see a very similar structure of, of analysis running through people from Gray to Pound to Frankfurter to Learned Hand to Justice Scalia, Hart and Sachs, Landis, all of them very, very similar intellectual structure. So I do think that he absorbed some of this at the Harvard Law School. Other questions? Hi, uh, Jimmy Savalas, uh, 2L. Um, so you mentioned Chevron, yes, uh, and Justice Scalia was a supporter of Chevron. Uh, and it may have, have changed somewhat over the years. Um, and if the contemporary understanding of the justification for Chevron deference is that we're imputing a legislative intent that seems to be non-textual um, to delegate two agencies the ability to fill in gaps and to you know, make reasonable policy determinations within the gap of ambiguity. Yeah. Um, is, are we, can we reconcile that with this textualist approach, uh, you know, a rejection of legislative intent? And, hmm. and is it that different from, say, the position of a justice that uh, imputing a legislative intent to allow justices, the judicial branch, to smooth out, uh, you know, general legislation, and is it just a functional difference there, where we believe stronger institutional competence of agencies versus the justice, you know, the judicial branch, and is that, you know, a strong enough justification, you know, resting back on like a functionalist argument? Yeah. So I don't think it's a functionalist. Uh, um, I, I think this is one of those areas. So Justice Scalia had, had sort of two um, ideas about interpretation that I thought were pretty attractive, right? One was when a statute is clear and precise, treat it as clear and precise. When a statute is vague and open-ended, treat it as vague and open-ended, right? So treat it as an invitation to make policy, as a delegation. He, had, he was not worried about delegations. And I think the right way to justify Chevron is quite simple, right? It doesn't depend on intent, but it depends on the following alignment. Congress says, EPA, tell us what a stationary source is. Promulgate a regulation that tells us what a stationary source is. Oh, you haven't told us what stationary source means. Who gets to decide? Well, the agency is the one that's supposed to tell us and what we'll say is, is the agency wrong? If the agency stays within the broad boundaries of the word stationary source, or public interest, convenience, and necessity, or fair and equitable rate making, or any of these very open-ended words, then we have no basis for disturbing what the agency's done. I think that, rather than intent, is the proper justification for Chevron. And I think it's somewhat different from judges smoothing over statutes. The premise of Chevron is indeterminacy. And Justice Scalia, I think, would have been the first person to say, if there's, if there's indeterminacy, that's an invitation to the institution with responsibility to act to fill in the gaps. But if the statute's clear, 
no smoothing over, even if it seems awkward and strange and leads us to results that we don't especially like. And so he, ha he, he relied on Congress to say how much smoothing authority he had. And, and that, seems like the right, that seems like the right approach to me. Please join me in thanking. Thank you very much.